This tank chat's going to be about this vehicle, the Centurion that was recently given to us by the Swiss military. Please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. Now, I'm going to make a bit of a difference this time round because you've seen a lot of our tank chats on Centurion tanks. This time I'm going to talk a little bit about how Switzerland came to buy the Centurion in the 1950s and some of the story behind that. Now, most of you who are watching this will probably know that Switzerland has had a long tradition of neutrality. Um, since the Congress of the Vienna in 1815, Switzerland has tried to be independent, but it's also had a, quite a considerable armed force to ensure it keeps that independence and its own neutrality. Now, Britain has always tended to back that because again, in the 19th century, Britain saw the fact of an independent Switzerland there on its own as a neutral. It meant it helped, it didn't ally itself to another country and upset the balance of power in Europe. And of course, Britain in the 19th century is really keen on that balance of power so that it ends up being able to trade its goods with all the different countries and no one country becomes too dominant. So Switzerland and Britain have a long relationship. And as part of that relationship, one of the things that builds up is also cultural. British people go to Switzerland, think of the Romantic movement, they absolutely fall in love with the Swiss scenery and end up going there as visitors, painting it, etc., etc. So there's a long-term relationship that's established between Britain and Switzerland. Now that relationship is put to the test in the Second World War. Um, what happens is Switzerland ends up being accused as being a profiteer from the war by some of the Western allies because Switzerland has basically taken stolen Nazi gold, taken it into its own bank accounts and paid back to the Nazis hard currency, Swiss francs, which helped them continue the war effort. There's also criticism as well that, that certain Swiss companies only deal with the Nazi regime and the government actually puts into place one or two policies that are very anti-Semitic, similar to the Nazis. So in 1945, America is in the position where it actually freezes all the Swiss bank accounts in America because at the end of this period of the Swiss trying to keep their independence and neutrality through that period, actually the Allies, a number of them are really thinking, hang on, you chose the wrong side or you didn't choose the right side in the war and by your efforts, you may have prolonged it. Now, Britain is slightly more pragmatic about this and argues the case that Switzerland should be brought back into the international community. Um, they argue from the point of view as well of doing a deal that ends up being signed in 1946 where the Swiss hand over half the amount of money they've got to uh, the Western Allies from that stolen Nazi gold and they also do what might be termed a voluntarily given donation of 250 million Swiss francs to help rebuild Europe. And at the same time, they actually give credit accounts to France and Britain for 250 million Swiss francs again to help them re-establish trade links, etc., and get buying again. So Britain is helping Switzerland back into the international community. And you have the situation as well where people like Churchill, uh, even Field Marshal Montgomery, they actually visit Switzerland as tourists and um, Montgomery starts talking to the Swiss military, getting friendly with them, looking at Switzerland as a potential power that is going to be anti-communist. Now the Swiss military situation is really a, an awkward one because before the Second World War they have been looking at the idea that if they were ever attacked they would retreat to a mountainous redoubt where they have supplies, munitions, stores are actually kept, but they basically give up a lot of their territory to get to that mountain redoubt. What happened is during the war that attitude changes because there's a plateau area of Switzerland with industry, lots of population, they decide no, we're going to change our tactics and defend that area too should we ever be attacked.
And that leads the Swiss military to start realising that will be much more mobile warfare. We're going to need potentially the tank. And the idea then is in 1946, um, the Swiss start the process of looking for a tank to put into service that will meet their particular requirements. Now their very first trip in 1946 is actually see a British Comet tank in Italy. In 47, they buy about 150 G13 tank destroyers. We've seen that in our Hetzer tank chat. And they look at those as being a way of potentially stopping incoming tanks as an anti-tank measure, but they haven't actually decided on a turreted tank that they think they do want. Now, the Swiss set up a commission to look at what is going to be the best way of, of, of coming up with a solution to this problem. Do we go for a light tank? Now, in this particular period, France is trying to re-establish its own arms industry after World War II. They are going to be designing a light 13-tonne tank that is going to ultimately become the AMX-13. Now, that particular tank has not been built yet, but the French start going to the Swiss saying, look, if you want a light vehicle, why don't you come in with us and purchase the AMX-13? Britain has got the Centurion going into production and it's, it's widely acknowledged as being a successful design. So Switzerland is also looking at the British Centurion, but would the Centurion be too big and too heavy to be used on Swiss mountain roads and some of the terrain and scenery there? So this commission is set up to really look into that as a problem. Now, uh, Britain says, why don't you come over and have a closer look at the Centurion tank? So a Swiss delegation comes over from Switzerland and ends up visiting here, where I am today, Bovington, where the then Director Royal Armoured Corps, Nigel Duncan, actually takes them round, shows them Centurions firing down on the ranges. Um, Nigel Duncan, incidentally, then goes on to be later the curator here at Bovington Tank Museum. Um, and the Swiss delegation is also taken up to Vickers, the factory in Newcastle that is building Centurion tanks. And the Swiss, you know, they're very impressed by the Centurion. They put in an order for four tanks. Um, and they are offered, the idea is that it's going to cost you about 625,000 Swiss francs to buy a Centurion, much cheaper, 276,000 Swiss francs to buy a Comet tank. And Comet production's coming to its end. Britain's trying to sort of say, why don't you buy some of these, you know, potentially as well from us. Britain is desperate at this period for hard cash. It is wanting money to help industry in the UK. Um, Britain is pretty much bankrupt after the end of the Second World War. It still has, immediately after the war, quite a bit of influence. It's one of the victors from the Second World War. It's got a large army still, large arms industry, but it has no money. So the idea of selling Centurion tanks to the Swiss is really appealing because it means we can get exchanges going again. We can start getting some hard currency coming back into the country. The problem though, is even though the Swiss like the idea of the Centurion, what happens in 1950 is the Korean War begins and suddenly the world situation changes. Britain has a priority of saying our tanks that we are making in the factories, first priority is go to the British Armed Forces, second priority goes to Commonwealth countries, third priority to NATO, and only defence sales are in fourth place. Now, the world looks a very dodgy place in the middle of 1950 because there is the worry of the potential of an east-west conflict. Luckily, it's contained in essence in Korea, but from the point of view of uh, the Western allies, new armaments programmes are started again. It's a big rearmament five years after the Second World War. So Britain is basically saying the tanks we are going to build are going to be for our own forces. Switzerland are now thinking, hang on, the world's getting even more dangerous. They are very keen to buy tanks, but no one's wanting to sell them at that particular moment. The Swiss make a proposal to the British and said, could we actually build Centurion tanks in Switzerland? They've already started under license. They've been building jet engines. They've been buying the Hunter and the Vampire jets from Britain. 
and they are looking at the idea, what about homegrown production or licensed production? Um, but Britain looks at this. The problem is, is ultimately the Swiss are not going to be able to make the armour plate. And the armour plate is, uh, again, in Britain, is going straight into production for British forces and, again, going through its allies and its own Commonwealth countries. So from that point of view, it becomes a bit of a non-starter. There's also, interestingly at the time, a secrecy issue and there's a worry that should Switzerland get overrun, um, the technology that's going into, especially the welding of the Centurion, will be then available to the threat, which was then considered the communist Russia and the Soviet bloc. So the Swiss actually said, look, we'll blow up the factory if that was to happen but it still didn't hold any water with the British. They ended up saying, no, we can't sell those to you, um, the made tanks, and we can't really do a practical way of doing a license. Switzerland then is then looking, we still need a tank. America is starting to thaw um, from its attitude of being pretty much anti-Swiss after, immediately after the Second World War. And an American company Kaiser Frazier comes up with an idea of saying, listen, we might be able to sell you 200 M26 Pershing tanks. And the Swiss are interested in that and start looking into it. The Americans then say in the in middle of 1951, no, actually, we're not sure about being able to do that. It may affect some of our own production capacities, even though they're moving on now to the M47 and slightly later the M48 tanks in America. So the Swiss have still got a bit of a problem there. But what happens in the middle of 1951, there's a stalemate in Korea and the world situation changes slightly. So from being, in essence, a seller's market, it now becomes a buyer's market in terms of tanks and Britain slightly changes its tune because it's now in the position of saying, hang on, we probably don't need quite as many centurions for our own forces, Commonwealth and NATO. We may well be in a position now to say to Switzerland, look, we can now sell this to you. The Swiss are looking at sending a delegation to America to have a look at the, what the Americans might be able to offer them for sale. Um, and the situation in Britain, we're now sort of slightly nervous. How do we reintroduce the Centurion to the Swiss military? How do we say now's a good time? So in Britain, they actually go to a famous uh, theorist, Basil Little Hart, who is asked on behalf of the British government, go and have a chat with the Swiss, go and say to them, you can now buy from us for about £50,000 an item, a Centurion tank. And the emphasis, yet again, is put on Basil Little Heart. Hard currency is what Britain is requiring at this particular time. Now, Little Heart goes off. He discusses it with the Swiss. Um, he comes back. The Swiss are prepared to put in an order for two centurions to have a look at. But they're also doing that order really to make the Americans realize they're not just going to go for American kit straight away they're looking at the marketplace because all of a sudden, as I say, it's changed from kit being needed for their own militaries to suddenly actually we can be in a different position now and start selling things. Now Churchill is behind, he's now become Prime Minister again in Britain, he's behind the idea of selling these tanks to Switzerland. Um, the Swiss delegation goes off to America, it starts touring in, uh, from August to October 1952. They're ending up looking at tanks over in America, they're shown the M47. Um, there's a possibility they might be able to buy these. Originally, Americans are saying, no, no, you can only have M4 tanks. They are starting to be seeing the M48 tank as well. They're shown that to a degree, but told they're only for our own forces so far. And the Swiss are trying to weigh up what's the best option. Within the Swiss military, there's still a faction that says go for something light. There's still sailors saying, let's go for the AMX-13. France is now heavily pushing that. And Britain in the background is still politely trying to say, what about our centurion? We kind of think this is a world beater. You guys ought to have this one, shouldn't you? So the Swiss delegation, they look at these different options. They actually get the Swiss parliament to debate it. Um, 
February 53, the British attache gets the flavor from the Swiss that he's saying it looks pretty grim. It doesn't look like we're going to be able to um, sell the Centurion. The Swiss seem to be liking the M48 more and are pushing the Americans for that, but there's deadlock. Um, the Swiss decide, let's do some more tests with imported vehicles. They are quite determined that we need something in service, so they put in an order for 200 AMX 13s, uh, which come a couple of years later that go into service with the Swiss military, but they're still, that's not their ideal solution. They are still looking at a heavier, um, proper main battle tank, as it were, to come into service. And in March 1954, they actually go back to the British order 10 centurions and they are um, encouraged by Britain because there's the arguments about balance of payments, please buy them from us, we really need that currency. And after much further debate that goes in, March 1955, so really five years later than the first look at the centurion, Finally, the Swiss Parliament agrees a budget and agrees that they are going to put an order in for 100 Centurion tanks. Um, now, that is followed up relatively quickly because in November of 1956, you get the Hungarian uprising. Switzerland again is nervous of the European situation deteriorating and they put another order in for another 100 Centurion tanks um, to come from Britain. So finally, there's a last scandal that gets associated with this purchase because it turns out that the Swiss defence attaché in 1949, who'd opened up negotiations, used an agent on behalf of the Swiss government. The defence attaché was Hubert Reisner. His brother was Hans Reisner. And it turns out that Hans Reisner's company gets a big fat commission and that didn't go down too well in Switzerland. It led to stories in the press and it ended up with British politicians like Dennis Healy at the time asking questions in the House of Commons, is this the best way of doing business? Why aren't we buying government to government? Why are you using intermediaries and companies like Vickers? Britain has to knock a little bit off the price of the Centurions it's selling to Switzerland because it has to be seen to be doing a gesture um, to meet basically Swiss public demands that this didn't look good, that backhanders are going on. Um, Little Hart, by the way, fell out with the British government because he didn't think he got paid enough um, being the middleman as well, trying to sell Centurion tanks to um, the Swiss military. So it's a complex sounding story. Um, in the end, the Swiss end up with the Centurion, just like this one here behind me. So as to the actual tanks that were provided, March 55, 100 Mark V tanks are actually sold and they go into service in Swiss service, they're called the Panzer 55. In 57, it then is 100 Mark VII tanks are sold and they become the Panzer 57. Now, what happens in Swiss service, they have one or two conversions, some of which you can see. Inside, you can't see, they end up with Swiss radios being fitted. They have the newer type of Swiss smoke dischargers, which is a, a different calibre from some of the other ones. On the front, you'll notice there's different types of lights to match the requirements of the Swiss road system. But fundamentally, they are very much a British Centurion that the Swiss loot uses. In 1961, they buy yet another 100 Centurion tanks. These actually come from South Africa. South Africa comes out of the British Commonwealth it's been supplied with Centurions and uh, basically they're saying we don't think we need these, we're not now a Commonwealth company, country, we're not now going to go and support the uh, NATO countries etc in Europe should a war come, so they end up selling some of their Centurions and Switzerland buys another hundred from South Africa. Um, the guns are upgraded, so you've got the L7 105mm guns replacing some of those early 20 pounder guns all tanks are upgraded by 1979 and basically the story is if you're an upgraded Panzer 55 you become a Panzer 55 60. If you're an upgraded Panzer 57 you become uh, with a 105 millimeter gun you become the Panzer 57 60. Um, and ultimately the Centurion like so many Centurions that's put into service it's ultimately replaced um, later in the 1980s 
by the PZ87, as the Swiss call it, which is basically about, they buy 280 Leopard 2 tanks off of Germany. And that, uh, we've mentioned it before, that idea that so often countries that use the Centurion, when it was time to replace them, they move on to either Leopard 1 or Leopard 2. And now we're very grateful, obviously, for the Swiss for giving us this lovely Centurion. It's obviously been in store, well looked after, almost mint compared to some of our vehicles in the collection here. It's one of those upgraded Centurions with obviously the 105 mm gun. Hopefully you'll be able to see this if you come along to the museum. We will be running this. It's in perfect working order in the future. And thanks again, I just say bearing with us. It's a bit of a cold, windy day here. We've got vehicles driving past. We've got commentary on in the background. So if you stayed this long, thanks very much and uh, keep an eye open for our next tank chat.